name is Aaron Leonard with Another Summit, and I'm here today to teach you about the 10 essentials. You might ask yourself, what are the 10 essentials? And what they are is a collection of items that's going to make your time outdoors much safer. Let me tell you a story. In my local community, I volunteer as a firefighter, and just last weekend, we rescued three people off of one of our mountains here in the Hudson Valley of New York, and they were totally unprepared. They got caught out after dark. They couldn't see where they were going. They didn't know where they were. They had no protection from the elements. They were hyperthermic when we ran across them on the trail and they needed to be rescued. If they had packed appropriately for the weather conditions and the place that they were going to explore, then they would have not had any of those issues. So the 10 essentials are designed to help you to be better prepared for where you go. Now, they don't always look the same. 10 essentials are systems that we use and we adapt them for the type of trip that we're gonna go on and the weather conditions that we're in and the train that we're in. So I'm gonna show you some basics and then we're gonna look at each of these in detail. But essentially, they consist of a first aid kit, some water or hydration, some extra food, some type of uh, protection from the elements, uh, sun protection, bug spray, navigational aids like a map, some way to signal people if you need help or get lost, like a whistle. A way to see in the dark with extra batteries, so a flashlight with extra batteries. Just in case you need to start a fire to stay warm, something to light that fire with. And then lastly, an emergency shelter. Emergency shelter can be as simple as this bag right here. The first item we're gonna look at in detail is our first aid kit. There's different types of first aid kits that you can purchase or you can build on your own to take on your trips. One type is, is something that's prepared for you. So this one is an example, it's rather large. It's made for a larger group of people and it's also made for use in more remote wilderness areas. Perhaps a place where if somebody was injured and needed to leave the hike or the trip, it might take them 12 to 24 hours before they were able to be evacuated. But this is not necessarily something you need to take your family on a day hike. What I prefer to use when I'm doing something like that is a kit that I make on my own. It has some medical tape, you know, a sprained finger or something like that. It has a small face bandage that can help wrap up a sprain, like a sprained ankle. And then it has some minor medical uh, fixes, I suppose, band-aids. Great thing for small cuts, iodine, other ointments to disinfect any injuries that somebody might get before you put that band-aid on. A pair of tweezers, which you can do a lot with. Tweezers can be anything that you buy as a tweezer. These are just designed for wilderness because they're small and they're easy to pack. And this is a great device. It's called a tip key. In the Northeast, there's a lot of ticks. We want to remove a tick as soon as possible. And this tip key is a really simple way to do so. So that's all that I carry in a first aid kit for a day hike. And, the, and this larger one is something that I would carry if I was leading like a backpacking or a canoeing trip that was gonna be days long in the wilderness. Uh, but the key is to bring a first aid kit and you can build one of your own for what your own needs are. Next on our list is hydration. The rule of thumb for hydration is that if you're in the wilderness, you usually need one to two liters of water for say a two or a three hour hike in the woods. I usually carry one liter of water and the ability to make clean water using local sources. This is a one liter bottle. So it's one liter of water and then I have a couple of different ways that I can make clean water. One really effective way is with this device, it's called a life straw very inexpensive and it allows you to take water out of a stream or a creek or a lake even to drink straight out of the stream or the lake or out of the bottle that now has the, the dirty water in it. You use this like a straw and you just suck the water up. Another way which I prefer is to use a filter such as this one right here made by a company called Sawyer. The way that works is this bag becomes the dirty water bag and we fill this bag up with water. Just by sticking it underneath the water, the bag will fill up. Once the bag is filled up, we attach the filter to it and then simply squeeze the water out through the filter and back into our bottle and we make another liter of clean water. Why do I only want to carry one liter of water? Because water weighs and we want to keep our backpacks light. The less I carry, the lighter my backpack is. Next on our list is uh, nutrition. Nutrition is important whenever you spend time outdoors because as your body burns calories, it's going to need some energy to replace it. What I typically ask participants to do is every 60 to 90 minutes that we're moving on a trail or that we're outside somewhere, I ask them to take a break and get something to eat. In this instance, I've got a, an apple, an orange and a small nut bar, but it's really anything that you want to take with you into the wilderness. Now 
Delicious. Next on our list is additional insulation. Here is one set of our 10 essentials that we adjust depending on the weather. Today is the second day of spring, so it's still cold outside, and what I would carry on a hike for today, and I might even be wearing it while I'm hiking, is a light down jacket, a raincoat, and the raincoat doesn't necessarily only have to be for rain, it can also help to block wind. The down jacket with the raincoat keep me warm down to almost freezing. And I also include, for my own personal comfort, what I prefer is a knit cap, as well as some lightweight gloves. If it's uh, summertime and I'm not needing to worry too much about cold weather, then I won't carry these items. I'll just bring a raincoat. I know it's hard to believe, but we're already at the halfway point of our 10 essentials. This is number five, protection from the sun. And we've added protection from insects as well. Protection from the sun is really about not allowing yourself to become sunburned. Sunburns are an injury that can become damaging and dangerous, especially for very young children or if you're in a remote part of the wilderness, sunburns can cause your trip to go from something that's fun to something that you're really not enjoying. So we try to avoid being burned at all times. We use whatever sunblock or sunscreen that we prefer. This is my preferred choice. Protecting our eyes is important, so we wear some type of sunglasses that have UV protection. Depending on where you're at and the time of the year, you may want to add some bug spray to that mix. Now the important thing about bug spray in the Northeast, we need to use bug spray that's going to protect us against ticks. Ticks do not get repelled by any natural product-based bug sprays, like a citronella-based bug spray. The bug sprays that we recommend all contain between 20 and 30 percent D in order to protect you against tick bites. Remember, ticks are vectors for a number of different blood-borne illnesses in the Northeast, so it's very important that we protect ourselves from ticks. Earlier, we showed you the tick key that I always carry in my own first aid kits, and now we're showing you bug spray that has at least 20 percent DEET inside of it. That's the most effective way to prevent from ticks. When we go out into the woods later, we'll show you how to properly apply this insect repellent. Number six on our list is navigational aids. Navigational aids can be a paper map, a compass, such as a compass that's built into this whistle. It can be a cell phone app that you use. Regardless of what you choose to use as your navigational aid when you're exploring out there in nature, it's important that you always have something so that you're prepared to find your location or determine which way to go left or right on the trail. Really understand the space that you're in. Now at the beginning of any trail that you go on, you typically find a map board, a big board that has a map on it, an arrow that says you are here, but not always. Sometimes you go to a trailhead or to a park and there is no map board available that really describes the space you're about to go in. So you need to do some reconnaissance before you arrive. Now one of the ways to do that is by using an app. There's an app that's free to use called the REI Hiking Project. It's a collection of trails around the United States that REI has captured and offers their advice for free. And the app itself allows you to locate yourself on the map on the trail that you're on. Another app that you can use that you can pay for is called All Trails. It's an excellent app that I personally use to plan and then lead the hikes that I'm on. But I do always remember one thing. Your cell phone should not be your primary source of navigation because it runs on a battery or it can be dropped or lost. So you really need to always have a paper map. So this is the paper map of the area that we're in right now. And that paper map is not gonna run out of battery power and this map is made with the water resistant material by the agency that manages the trails in the area. It's the best map for the space that we're in. It's accurate, it shows all of the trail markings that are in the area, and these are the ones that we explore. So the paper map is an essential item that I always bring with me. And then one of my signaling devices, and we'll get to those in a minute, is this whistle that has a built-in compass. I don't need to bring a compass that's going to be used for navigating from one point to another over land, like a lensatic compass perhaps. But this little compass just gives me the ability to determine direction, which is always nice to be able to, to determine, especially if you're lost. Just knowing direction itself might get you out of a bad situation. So for me, navigation is a map and a compass. So number seven is the signaling device used to help a rescuer or a friend or family member find your location. It's also used to help notify folks in the area that you're in need of help, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. The two types of signaling devices that I recommend you have, the signaling mirror, and these usually come with instructions on the back that describe how to use it, but essentially what you do point the mirror, say at a helicopter or a fire truck or a police car or people in the woods. There's a little peephole in the middle and you 
point the peephole at whoever it is you're trying to signal and any sunlight that's available is going to be reflected at them. This does not work all the time though, like at night. So a more effective signaling device is a whistle. Earlier this was my compass, but now it's my whistle. Rescue whistles are designed to make a real high-pitched squeal noise like you just heard. They attract people to your location. There's a way to do that. If you are lost, let's say that you walk off the trail or you're in a place that you're not familiar with and, and you're feeling nervous that you might be not able to find your way back, maybe you feel like there's some danger now and you need to be notifying somebody, you are lost and your cell phone doesn't work and you have no way to communicate, you can use a whistle. Or if you find yourself in a dangerous situation and you need help right away, you can use a whistle to notify everybody else around you that you need help. And the way you do that is you blow your whistle three times. And you pause and you wait three, four seconds and you do it again. Are your signaling devices. Get yourself a whistle. Number eight, one of my favorites, illumination. Lack of illumination is what gets people in trouble most often in the wilderness. They climb on top of a ridge line to watch the sunset. The sun sets. They only have their cell phone flashlight to illuminate the path back to their car. And cell phones never work very well doing that. They're not a strong enough light. And at the end of the day, after you've watched the sunset, now it's dark, your battery life might be so low that your cell phone dies before you're able to get back to your car. The most common type of rescue that we do in our fire department is rescuing a lost high after dark. They just can't see the trail and they can't come down off the hills. The type of illumination I recommend is a headlamp. Headlamps are designed to be used in the outdoors. They're waterproof. The batteries last a long time and they're very bright and illuminating. This light is designed with a red light but it's also designed with a white light. And that white light is strong enough to illuminate the entire trail in front of me and because I'm wearing it on my head it does an excellent job of illuminating the space where I'm walking. So I can see wherever I look, the light is shining. Handheld flashlights also work, but I prefer the headlamp. I always bring an extra set of batteries. You never know how many times you've used your headlamp or somebody else's uses it. You're an hour into a hike at night and the battery's dying, you're in the dark again. Always carry extra batteries for your headlamp. Number nine on our, our list is the ability to make a fire. Now this is not a campfire or a cooking fire, like something you would make to heat food up or, or to sit around and enjoy the evening with your friends. This is an emergency fire, something you're making for warmth, to dry clothes off that have gotten wet in a place where you're not gonna be rescued right away perhaps, even to be used as a signal fire, something to illuminate the area that you're in so rescuers can more easily find you. I'll show you how to make a fire using these two devices, the lighter and the spark device uh, when we go outside. All right, number 10, last on the list, the emergency shelter. When we think of emergency shelter, we're not thinking about bringing a tent with us every time we're in the outdoors. We're bringing something that we're gonna use to stay warm and dry as best as possible if we have to spend the night overnight in the woods unexpectedly or if even our car breaks down. So this is something that I always carry with me. I have uh, something just like it in the glove box of my car and then I always carry uh, enough for at least one person in my backpack. What this is, is, is my version of emergency shelter that I built using uh, three different things. One is some heating pads. I purchased some toe warmers, hand warmers, and these are our chemical warmers that you peel and stick underneath your arm, on your chest wall. And between these three things right here, it generates quite a bit of heat in critical areas to stay warm. And I also have an emergency poncho and an emergency blanket. And if I wrap this Mylar emergency blanket around my torso, and I put on this emergency poncho, then I'm gonna stay relatively dry and this emergency blanket's gonna help lock in some of the heat created by both my body and by these warmers. And then I'm gonna stay relatively warm. So this is my emergency shelter. So we've gone through all of our items for our 10 essential systems. What we need to do is carry it with us. I got myself a little backpack. We don't need too much room for all of this. I dropped my first aid kit into a place that's easy accessible. It's most likely I'm going to use a band-aid, so I'll stick that up here in this little pocket at the top so it's easy to find. Then I'm going to take my food and put it up there as well because I'm probably going to eat something while I'm hiking. The water I'll put in last. I'll go ahead and stash the water filters in a place in my bag that I can access, but I don't have to get them right away. So I'll put those at the bottom of the bag. The sunscreen and the bug spray I'll apply before I begin the hike, but I always bring some with me. My bag happens to have these little pockets on the outside. It's convenient, so I'll stick those in there. Sunglasses I'm gonna wear. 
the hat I'm gonna wear, but I'm not gonna wear my extra jacket, so I'll put this into the bottom. So I'll use that if I need it. The map I'm gonna be accessing on a regular basis, so I'll put that in the top as well. That way I don't have to go digging for my map because I know I'll probably look at it a few times. The emergency whistle itself is gonna go around my neck. You don't have to have it on the outside of your shirt, but you should always have it easy to access. Another place to carry an emergency whistle is in your pocket. My headlamp and my extra batteries, I may need them later, but I don't need them right now, so I'm gonna put those at the bottom of my bag as well. I'm gonna put my lighter down there because I won't need that unless there's an emergency. And my emergency shelter, I don't need that right now either, so that's also gonna go towards the bottom of my bag. And the last thing I'm gonna put in is my water at the top of the bag. So when I have this thing packed, I've got my bug spray and my sunscreen on the outside, then I got the water, then my jacket, and then everything else is below that. Zip it up, and we're ready to go. But we just have one more subject that we want to discuss before we hit the trail. Leave no trace, abbreviated as LNT. It's a set of seven principles that allow us to enjoy and protect our state and public parks. The first principle is to plan ahead and prepare. This involves researching the location that you want to visit, so you know of any rules or regulations that you have to follow. This also involves seasonal information like weather or high traffic times so that you can plan and pack appropriately. The second principle is to travel and camp on durable surfaces. This means sticking to pre-existing trails and campsites when possible. And if you do have to travel or camp in pristine areas, meaning untouched land, then you should try to stick to flat, rocky areas and to avoid your impact on vegetation. The third topic is to dispose of waste properly. This includes litter, human waste, and rinse water. Essentially, you want to pack out what you've packed in and leave any place that you've been cleaner or as clean as when you found it. For human waste, you want to bring a poop bag with a trowel for digging a cat hole and a bag for packing out used toilet paper. Some places even require you to pack out your own waste. This is a really big topic, so we'll discuss it further in our following videos. The fourth principle is leave what you find. This is exactly what it sounds like. Don't remove plants or rocks from the natural parks and don't damage them. Nobody wants to be the person who destroyed a 1,000 year old natural wonder. The fifth principle is to minimize campfire impacts. This means sticking to designated fire pits, springs, and stones. And when you gather the firewood, you want to stick to loose twigs and sticks that have fallen to the ground. You don't want to cut anything off of a standing tree, even if you think it's dead. And you don't want to chop up any fallen logs. These items play a really important role in the forest ecosystem. The sixth principle is to respect wildlife. This means that you shouldn't feed, follow, or harass any wildlife, or allow your pet to harass the wildlife. This includes trying to gain the attention of wildlife for a photo op. Another really important part of this principle is the proper storage of your food. But that's a big topic, so we'll discuss it further in our following videos. The seventh and final principle is to be considerate of others. Part of enjoying nature is to have a peaceful, relaxing time, and it's hard to do so when others are being loud or causing disturbances. Be respectful of those around you. These were the seven principles of Leave No Trace. And now that we've covered everything we need to know before we hit the trail, you can follow us in our next video, planning a day trip, to see how we implement the 10 essentials in Leave No Trace. I'm going to share the New York State Park website which is where you'll find all of the information you need to know about New York State Parks. So the link is parks.newyork.gov. And if you go to the visit section and go to state parks, this is where you can find all of the state parks in New York. So you can search by location. So if you don't wanna to drive too far, then you can search by region, which there are 11 regions. And if you're in the lower Hudson Valley area, then the ones you'll focus on are the Palisades region and the Taconic region, which border the east and west side of the river. You can also search by county if you want to, so you can find all of the parks in your county. So for now, we'll search in the Taconic region. And here I'll list all of the parks in the Taconic region. One of the most popular ones is Fonstock State Park which is a really cool park that has a lot of developed trails. It actually has over 70 miles of trails to hike on. 
and also has a recreational lake for boating and it has a lot of campsites for you to camp at. So when you go to the page for a state park, it'll have all the basic information like where to find it, a hotline for general info, and any important things you need to know. For example, it's telling us here that there's a pet policy and it tells us something about swimming, which is prohibited in Lower Cannabis Lake. At the bottom of the page, you'll find info about pets. So some areas don't allow pets at all. Some allow them on a leash, six feet in length. And some are allowed in the park, but not in certain areas of the park, like playgrounds and buildings. In these tabs on the side, you can find other things like fees, which are really important to know if you're gonna be parking. You wanna know whether or not you have to pay anything to park. So for the recreation area, you have to pay per car. But if you're just going to park for a hiking trail, you don't have to pay. There's also this. This is where you can find the downloadable PDF maps. So if we go here to the trail map, this is where you can see all of the trails in the park, which are clearly labeled with the name of the trail, the markings of the trail by color, like blue, orange, or red and how long the trail is, you know exactly how many miles you're going to be hiking. This is the kind of map that you want to print and take with you any time that you go into a state park so that you know exactly where you are and how to get to where you need to go. It has handy symbols like parking, viewing spots, camping areas, and boating areas. One useful tool that I like to use when I'm planning is a site called All Trails. When you go to all trails, it has an explore section, which allows you to search for trails either on the map like this, or if you know the name of the trail that you're looking for, you can go to that area. One of my absolute favorite things about the All Trails app is it shows the elevation of the hike. So it shows you how long the hike is and it also shows you the elevation. So here we know that this hike is a relatively flat hike that's not too steep. But if we go to one of these other hike options, you can see that it has a lot more steep areas. So this tells you how difficult the hike is gonna be before you even get there so you know exactly what to expect and what to prepare for. Another handy thing about All Trails is that it has, it allows people to rate the hikes. So now you know what to expect from people who have already done it. For example, it'll tell you which direction to go or to prepare for things like bug bites because in areas like this where there's a lot of water, you usually have to deal with mosquitoes as well. Another handy app that you can use, if you have, uh, if you get the events and map app for your phone, this allows you to download maps onto your phone and you can even use it offline and it uses geolocation to tell you where you are. So you always wanna bring a paper map with you just in case your phone breaks or anything happens. But if you do have your phone on you, you can use this to track exactly where you are. Once you've done all of your research about the state parks and where you want to go and what hike you want to do, the last thing that you want to do before you start packing is to check the weather. Now, Google's really nice for this because it can actually tell you right there exactly what the weather's going to be like for the week ahead of you. So before you go, you want to check the weather so you know if it's going to rain, if it's going to be hot or sunny or cloudy or anything of that sort. So now that you know exactly what to do, you can start packing. So this is where the 10 essentials video comes in. So just as a quick reminder, the 10 essentials are first aid, hydration, nutrition, insulation, sun slash bug protection, navigation, signaling devices, illumination, fire starter, and emergency shelter. Those are the 10 things that you absolutely want to make sure to bring with you on a hike. So now that you have all that you need to know, you can go ahead and plan your day hike.
All right, so you could use the New York State Park website that I shared in the last video, but this one's honestly much better when it comes to reserving campsites, just because it can be kind of confusing with the New York website. They have this new uh, website called Tenter that they try to push, but it's all pre-set up campsites and not like build your own tent kind of area. So if you're looking to put up your own tents and things like that, this is the site that you want to go to and it's reserveamerica.com. And this is where you can find all the New York state parks and you can find campsites in like, mm -hmm. so for example, the Father's Day hike is going to be happening in Fonstock State Park. So we can look that up. And so this will give you all the search results. And so you can see there's a whole list of things that you can look up here. And so we'll just go to campsite. And this shows you a handy little map where you can see all the available campsites. And so you can pick a day and you can pick a campsite and that allows you to reserve it from this site. So that's just one really handy and really easy way to reserve a campsite if you want to stay and it gives you like however many days you want to do it for and it uh it has a check-in time and a checkout time here but at most parks it's kind of like a you show up when you show up so you can show up at you know 12 p.m instead of 3 p.m and set up the site and it'll be good to go so there's also uh in particular a list of things that you want to bring with you so you have your tent essentials for like a regular trip, but then obviously when you're camping, you need things like a tent, sleeping bags, you definitely wanna make sure to bring some way to create water with you because you might be drinking a lot of water over the course of the night. Maybe you stay for three days, you wanna make sure you have water nearby. A lot of campsites have you know pumps so you can get water from, but if you're camping out in the middle of nowhere, you'll need a way to filter the water. So we have that handy little squeeze filter bag that we showed you in the first video. And those are relatively cheap and it's just a great way to uh, provide water. They also have uh, gravity filters where you can hang the bag up in a tree and have the water flow down to the bottom and it filters it that way, which is a really great way to have fresh water overnight. So you can wake up in the morning and make cereal or whatever you want to, which is really good. And then of course you want to bring extra bags to pack your food with. Like I know, especially in New York, bears can be a bit of an issue. So you want to make sure that uh, when you pack your food, you want to pack it in a tree branch that's at least eight feet away from the tree and 10 feet off of the ground because bears do climb trees and they might be able to get to it but if you hang it up far enough off the ground your food should be safe for the night and you also want to make sure to store all of your food at least 50 way <laughs> yeah the yeti coolers are pretty amazing but they still they they're smart bears are incredibly intelligent they can get into almost anything they even open car doors sometimes so you want to make sure that any of your food is nowhere near your campsite so you don't have a bear come sniffing around your tent in the middle of the night because that can be kind of spooky. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then also uh, one of the topics we touched on in the Leave No Trace uh, video was how to deal with your human waste. So sometimes you gotta go number two and you're in the middle of the woods, there's not a bathroom nearby, you gotta figure out what to do. So the general rule of thumb is 500 feet away from the campsite and 500 feet away from any source of water. And you're gonna bring like a trowel with you to dig a hole and basically you just dig a cat hole you poop in the hole and then you cover it up and that way nobody has to step on it or anything like that and you're far enough away from the campsite and everybody else that you're not going to get walked in on or something like that <laughs> yeah so that's um pretty much it to be honest uh camping overnight it's just making sure you have enough food with you making sure that you have water Honestly, when it comes to camping, even if you're out there for a couple of days, there are a lot of foods that you can bring with you if you have a cooler full of ice. It's just depending on what you want to carry. So when it comes to car camping, there's a lot more you can do because you have your car like 20, 30 feet away that holds all of your stuff. And when you're camping, if you're backpacking through the woods, then you just have to consider what you're able to carry and what you're willing to bring with you. Because you could bring a couple of steaks with you if you really wanted to have something tasty for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I have a question about the bears. So yeah. we had done a lot of tent camping pretty much all over the country. Um, but then when we were in New York, the same time that the bear got into the Yeti cooler, you know, we were told not to even sleep in the clothes that you cooked in. So where are you supposed to put these clothes? Like we were tent camping, 
Like, what do you yeah, So I haven't actually heard anyone say that you shouldn't sleep in the clothes you cook. Yeah, the campground told us as we were coming in. And I was like, that was the first time we'd ever heard it in 15 years of tent camping. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. They One post the they have that posted in Colorado because they have fair um boxes and they have it posted after you're done. Um cooking your food to put your clothes in a bag and then put them in the bear box yeah yeah another issue is a lot of campsites they have you know the campfire right next to where you're putting your tents and the bears will be able to smell any food that was cooked and any leftovers that might have been scraped off into the ground and so another way to work around that is just to have your uh cooking area be a little bit further away from where you're sleeping so that way uh they're not like coming in and smelling the food and then coming two feet away and smelling you covered in like grease or something like that so and also just making sure that nobody has any like random snacks in their pockets because they have an amazing sense of smell but also one tip that i learned when i was camping in the woods is bears absolutely hate the smell of cayenne pepper it's one of the it's one of the recipes uh, the ingredients in the bear repellent spray is cayenne pepper so if you uh, season your food with that, or if you sprinkle a little bit of that around your campsite, not too much to like hurt any of the, you know, biodiversity or anything like that, but sprinkling a little bit of that can help to deter them because they'll get a good whiff of it and say, oh, that hurts my nose. So, yeah. So going back to the firewood discussion, and this is something that um, I wasn't aware of, but some, I think state parks don't allow you to collect firewood um, from the location. So you had said to remember, I think to bring your own, do you have any recommendations on that? Yeah. So, um, uh, normally you can get firewood. Sometimes they sell it at the, like the office, they'll have firewood for sale there that you can pick up. And that's just their way of guaranteeing that you're using firewood that's from the correct area. So you're not bringing anything in. And then also, as far as I know, there are some gas stations that sell firewood as well. So you can drop by a gas station and pick up firewood there. You just want to make sure you're not bringing anything from home or uh, a lot of state parks don't allow people to go around chopping down trees for their firewood. And so you can still collect twigs and stuff off of the ground to start the fire with. But if you're bringing in logs for like a decent campfire, then you can get that from the park office on your way into the park or you can drop by a gas station and grab some there. Mm -hmm.